Salutations, gentle viewers. I am George from Ireland. So this video is about uh, India's influence on the British Isles. When I say India, we've got to look back to pre-1947 India, uh, so including what's now Pakistan and uh, Bangladesh, Greater India, um, one might term it. So um, people often look at what influenced the United Kingdom and uh, what's now the Republic of Ireland wrought upon India in bygone centuries. But people seldom ask themselves uh, how it went the other way, how South Asia um, had an effect on the British Isles. And that's a question that I find uh, intriguing. Um, so when uh, Britishers started sailing to India, it was the 16th century. Um, and at that time, the two countries were almost at parity in terms of technology. The United Kingdom, well, it wasn't the United Kingdom at the time, the British Isles, and uh, Western Europe in general were about to leap ahead of India technologically and in scientifically. However, if you go a few centuries back from that, you'll find that, of course, that India was streets ahead of the British Isles and, and of Europe um, in general. Um, people would often point out that uh, the Indians invented a, a lot of mathematics, so and that went to the Arabs, and the Europeans, Crusaders, got that from the late 11th century onwards, the concept, the concept of zero. We often say, we call them Arabic numerals, the numerals we write, when really they originated in India. Because of course, in most Indian languages, North Indian languages anyway, people write left to right, whereas Arabic it's right to left. Except when they're writing numbers, bizarrely, in Arabic, it's left to right, because they got them from the Indians. I don't know how they manage it. You know, I'm going this way, ooh, that way, and then this direction again. Must be terribly confusing. Um, chess for instance that we got by way of the arabs so europeans often wrongly believe that uh, we got this it was it originated amongst our ishmaelite brethren uh so uh, a few centuries ago india was much more advanced than western europe um and not just uh, in terms of erudition and culture but in terms of humanity just being a more humane society if you look back to the time of ashoka um, inventing human rights, um, uh, freeing people from servitude, and you can see his tablets all, all over India in which his decrees were proclaimed and people were granted greater liberty under him. And he was obviously well ahead of his time. Unfortunately, um, India regressed after that. That's often the case. It's not just progress, continuous, relentless progress. Sometimes we go backwards and things get worse. Obama may say there's an arc that bends towards justice, that even if, if the cause of human upliftment suffers setbacks, eventually it overcomes those, it keeps driving forward. Well, the dynamic isn't always like that. I wish it were, but anyway, so far, the last few decades, India's made the most uh, tremendous headway. Um, so uh, Ashoka, you'll see his three lions as the emblem of India. Truth alone triumphs. The uh, motto of India, which I think is from him as well. Uh, so on um, uh, Christmas uh, Eve 1600, the Honourable East India Company received its charter from Elizabeth I. And it's from then on that British has started to tr trade on a significant scale with India. Prior to that, there'd just been a few missionaries, very few merchants just on the coast of India. The Mughal Empire was at its height, ruling certainly all of North India, most of South India. And so uh, these uh, mariners were uh, going to um, India. And for Europeans, India was very vaguely defined. We said the East Indies eventually, because we'd realised that the West Indies, the Caribbean islands, we'd realised that the Caribbean was not in Asia. So when we were going to the West Indies, of course, that meant what's now Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, um, and so forth. Um, anyway, so Indians started coming to uh, the British Isles on these ships, Indian sailors, some of them settling. So almost all the Indians who arrived in the 17th century were men, and they intermarried with um, British women. We'd only just started using the word British again after centuries. So um, mostly in England, overwhelmingly in London, very seldom Wales or Scotland. Ireland, um, you know, I know people in Ireland have, have a canary if I say that we're British, but we are ethnically, culturally, not, not by citizenship mostly. Um, so very seldom going to Ireland in those days. And so these people, they had children, half Indian, half white, 
the next generation a quarter Indian, three quarters white, the next generation a one eighth Indian, seven eighths white. So they just um, disappeared into the white British community. They blended in. As I say, we didn't use to use the word British in the 17th century very much. We we're just rediscovering the Romans, what they used to call those, that, that part of the world, Britannia. So what did uh, people sail to India for? What were they bringing back? Spices, spices sometimes, ivory, tigers, live ones occasionally, but um, tiger skins. Um, and eventually, um, well, getting tea from China, growing in India, people think, well, there's nothing more Indian than tea. No, until the 17th century, it wasn't consumed there. It was a Chinese thing. When it came to the British Isles, um, who was it? Samuel Pepys wrote about tea, T W E, a China drink, drink, um, and uh, all sorts of things. Um, opium, indeed, uh, produced in India as well as in China. Um, and the Indians were sometimes buying British manufacturers, silk, damask, cashmere, that wool. We spell it C A S H M E double uh, M E R E, uh, and so on, and various objets d'art. So um, India began to fire the British imagination. It seemed like such an enormous, uh, very colourful civilization, so radically different, so advanced, so ancient. It played the same role in the British imagination that Egypt had in the Roman imagination. Something so exotic, seductive, something incomprehensible. Um, so the East India Company had its own army and navy, and as the Mughal Empire began to decline and break up, provincial governors and generals carving out their fiefdoms, then so lawlessness set in and many Darku's bandits were um, wreaking havoc. Um, so Britishers there had became, were writers for the East India Company, just clerks, we'd call them these days, doing the office work, had to learn the Indian languages. And so Surat um, in Gujarat was the first in, uh, British factory we call it factory trading post, I suppose. And various entrepôts were set up on the coast. And Britishers very seldom went further than that. Occasionally, some British emissaries managed to go to Delhi and parley at the uh, Mughal Emperor's court. And then the British focus of operations shifted to Bengal. So some Britons were learning Bengali, various other Indian languages. But Persian was perhaps the lingua franca of, of North India. Remember, um, the uh, ruling class in India at the time were mostly Muslims, particularly in North India. Though they were a minority, but because of course this included Pakistan and Bangladesh, they were not as much of a minority as they are today. If we put the whole of South Asia together today, Muslims would comprise perhaps 30%. And so it might have been something like that if we went back to the, um, back to the uh, 17th century. But in North India, it might have been more like 50%. Obviously, very much concentrated in certain zones, the very east, the very west what's now Pakistan and what's now Bangladesh. Um, and so some Britishers were fascinated by what they could learn from India, um, a senior civilization. Um, and famously, there's an example of Sir William Jones, an Oxford scholar and a judge. He went out to uh, Bengal um, to sit on the bench there, and he learned from various Indian uh, scholars of jurisprudence about uh, the uh, Hindu uh, scriptures, Hindu law, and um, Quranic law from Islamic scholars. So that's that. So translated into English, and people have formulated against me, say, what could he possibly teach them? Well, obviously, he was introducing some English laws to th there, but mainly he was learning from them. So he had to slim it down. He wasn't writing everything. I know he's a man of uh, commend compendious intellectual capacity, but the idea was not to write down absolutely everything, was slightly to distill it, as well as to translate some of these texts into English for the very first time. So come on, don't be too touchy. I'm not saying that he invented uh, Islamic law or Hindu law. He just wrote a precy of it. And um, Indian artwork enthralled many Britishers. But, um, and so obviously this came back home and you can see British oil paintings from the um, 17th century and they're quite often featuring Indians in the British Isles or indeed Indian themes. The, the, the painting is set in India even if the um, artist didn't actually go to the locale to execute his work. Um, what's uh, the next thing? So, um, uh, mustn't be too um, rhapsodic about it. Not every Britisher who went there was enamored of India, and some of them were there and business as business, they wanted to make money, that's it. 
uh, were not intrigued by the culture, were not broad-minded, didn't feel they had something to learn. Um, but the idea of uh, British superiority wasn't around back then. So I think they seldom looked with disdain um, at Indians and many uh, Britishers uh, married uh, Indian women at the time. Very few British women went to India back then. But uh, they really enjoyed themselves. You know, life was short. If malaria didn't get them, then the abuse of bung and opium might have done so. So it was live fast, die young, partly for these uh, guys of the British East India Company. Um, so, uh, and some men made their fortunes in India, returned to the British Isles, entered politics, became becoming known as Nabobs, as in Nawab, a name for um, an Indian Muslim ruler. And Diamond Pitt, that's Thomas Pitt, he brought back an enormous diamond from India, became fabulously wealthy, entered politics, founded the Pitt dynasty. His uh, grandson, William Pitt, that's Pitt the Elder, became Prime Minister, was raised to the title the Earl of Chatham. It's an aristocratic title. And Pitt the Elder's second son, William Pitt the Younger, was also Prime Minister. And there are many more examples of that. Um, people uh, uh, going out there to seek their fortune and striking it rich in South Asia. And sometimes uh, building things in an Indian style, bringing back tiles, various pieces of art, so began to influence the British culture more and more and was important in the British economy. So um, we fast forward a bit to, to the British Raj. Of course, the British government took an increasing role from the 1770s saying, well, the East India Company is not simply a commercial enterprise. The government has to exercise some sort of um, control. The various regulating acts came in to be um, reviewed and updated every 20 years and the British government demanded a greater say of all what was happening and demanding that um, Protestant missionaries, Christian missionaries be sent to India to try to evangelize. They had very little um, success in preaching the gospel to the Indians. That's where only 2% of Indians are Christians these days. Half of those are Catholic Christians, as in mainly converted by the Portuguese or the French. Um, so then the British Art Raj, as we know it, really wasn't set up till 1858 till after the defeat of the Indian Mutiny, or as many people prefer to call it, the First National War of Independence. Um, so the British Raj, whether it was good or evil, was mainly a, an Indian doing. Um, it was an Indian achievement, if you consider it to be something laudable, as in Indian professionals, Indian soldiers, Indian police officers, Indian civil servants, Indian laborers, Indian architects, Indian just about everything, um, are those who work for the Raj. The great majority of those who served the Raj um, in any capacity were, were Indian. There are just a few British officials right at the top. And there was the Indian civil service and so on. So um, the governments of some of the Indian states had been notorious for venality. And the Indian civil service was lauded for being remarkably free of graft. Can't say it was absolutely free, but I think it was kept to a very, very low level. Uh, one of the few complaints I don't hear from Indian nationalists about that is uh, a, um, a functionary would say, well, cross my palm with silver and all your problems will disappear and you'll get the decision you want. And obviously, um, Indians were coming to the United Kingdom in increasing numbers, not very serious numbers to the 1940s. But um, the British Empire elsewhere was not just by white Britons. Now, everyone was a British subject, to be, but to be British in those days, people would just simply assume you're white. Although... From, certainly from the 18th century onwards, a few British people were of Indian stock, of black ancestry as well. But as I say, quite often there were intermarriages, and these people became increasingly mixed into the white community, just were absorbed in, amongst the white community. But Indians went abroad as well, to other British colonies, to Fiji, to Kenya, to Trinidad, to South Africa, um, really anywhere you can name, but the first four are the ones where there was significant Indian immigration. So India helped to uh, build these countries and fill all sorts of posts. Mauritius is mostly uh, peopled by those of the Indian ethnicity. So the Indian army was obviously defending India, but serving in other quarters of the British Empire, fighting against Britain's enemies. Places like Ethiopia, a war that uh, is, is, is more or less forgotten, as well as the First World War, the Second World War. And of course, it's very doubtful that the Allies would have won the First World War had it not been for the Indian contribution. There was no conscription, they were all volunteers. Despite the Jalian, Jalianwala Bagh atrocity, um, the Indian army had no difficulty recruiting uh, 
Indian soldiers through the 1920s and 30s and into the Second World War. And again, it's difficult to see how the Allies would have won the Second World War had it not been for India's uh, fantastic contribution. So it's down to the valour and skill of Indian soldiers that the Allies triumphed. I know the Soviet Union did most of the rest of the fighting, but certainly in Asia, um, India's contribution was irreplaceable. So um, the Indian soldiers were fighting in the Opium Wars, and you might consider that an immoral cause, but there's, there's no question that um, British victory was accomplished principally through them. Um, and actually, if you look at modern India, modern India was then back fighting against India's current enemies, China, to some extent what we'd now call Pakistan, the northwest frontier, because the British Raj, if you go right back to the East India Company, wasn't created overnight, Rome wasn't built in the day, it started in 1600 and only reached its fullest frontiers in the 1890s, getting to the northwest frontier, as what we now call the Khyber Pukhtunkhwala, and indeed fighting in Afghanistan. And many Indians are very concerned about the Taliban today, would quite like a, a friendly Afghan government to allow them to set up bases there. So you can say, in fact, apart from the Britishers withdrawing, remarkably little has changed. So the Indian Army, famously, is the largest volunteer army of all time. People um, join that of their own free will. So um, anyway, as I said, Indians were moving to the United Kingdom, not in huge numbers, and admitted to the top schools in the United Kingdom from the mid-19th uh, century, Sri Aurobindo, attending St. Paul's School in London, which is one of the most illustrious educational institutions in the realm, going to Oxford University and Cambridge University, and so Indian languages were certainly studied at Oxford in the 18th century, and later the Indian Institute was opened by King Edward VII. He wasn't king at the time, he was Prince of Wales at the time he opened it. Um, and so Indians were settling there, particularly Parsis. You may know of Dadabao Naroji, the first person of the Indian ethnicity to be elected to the British Parliament in 1892, if memory serves, as a liberal. He didn't serve for very long, and then um, I think it was Baunagri, Baunagri the, another Parsi was elected as a Conservative MP uh, shortly later. Um, so uh, I think it was for Battersea, London. That's where um, uh, Dadabai Nauroji represented, whereas Balnagri served for um, Finsbury Park in London, if I've got that right. Um, and there was an Indian communist, Sakat Lava, who was elected as a, as a communist MP in the 1920s. And on and on. So Indians fulfilled all sorts of roles and ro rose up the ranks and were in the professions. But there were a tiny minority of the, of the British population. In the 1930s, there might have been 0.1% of the UK population. So were heavily concentrated um, in London, Manchester, Glasgow, just the major, um, major urban centres. It's only after the Second World War, Indians and at that stage Pakistanis and Bangladeshis began to arrive in serious numbers women as well as men for the first time. Not saying there were no Indian women prior to that, but very, very few. And indeed, an Indian woman was amongst the first women to uh, graduate with a law degree from Oxford University, or Indira Gandhi was there in the um, 1930s as well. Um, so despite loathing the UK in some ways, she was not discriminated against at university. Okay, she dropped out without a degree. That was her lookout. And her, indeed, her husband, he had been at the London School of Economics at that time. Well, Nehru famously went to Harrow School, amongst the top two schools in the kingdom, and then Trinity College, Cambridge. So of all the colleges at Cambridge University, Trinity is the most exalted. And of course, he was allowed to go there. There was a majlis, a society for Indian students to debate various uh, current topics. Well, there are many more examples of people from South Asia. Um, uh, Liaquat Ali Khan, later Prime Minister of Pakistan, he was at Oxford in the 20s. I could be here all night telling you about examples of this. Um, so, as I say, after the Second World War, the UK had a labour shortage. There was national service, as in British boys had to do two years in the armed forces, um, and a lot of reconstruction was needed. So people were recruited from South Asia, and the UK government even advertised jobs out there. So as Punjabis in particular came. Um, so look at Sikhs. Sikhs are about 2% of the Indian population, but they're about 30% of the British Indian community. Why? Are they just more likely to speak English? As in, if you could already speak English coming to the UK, uh, well, that makes going to make life a lot easier. 
If you were used to working around machinery, like driving things or working in factories, again, you had many more job opportunities. The more rural areas of India, with not many cars and not many factories, life in the UK was going to be a lot more of a shock to the system. We've got to remember the 1940s, the Indian literacy rate was only about 20%. Very, very few people had cars. Even in the UK, not many people had cars. Um, so those with stronger links to all things British were more likely to um, emigrate from and India and immigrate into the United Kingdom. So there was a former officer of the um, Indian Army who became manager of a factory in Southall, London. And he invited many of his former soldiers from various Sikh regiments to seek employment at this enterprise. And they came. And that's why Southall, which is in the west edge of London, is the centre of the Sikh community in the United Kingdom. And the railway station's got the sign in Punjabi. It's had its up since 98 in Punjabi, at least, as well as English. And so um, Southall is 50% uh, ethnically Indian. No exaggeration. And there are others from other South Asian countries there. And all the uh, British Indians there, most of them are Sikhs. Another thing is, sometimes I try to be a bit too inclusive, assuming that people of the Indian ethnicity in the UK are British. And they're not necessarily. Some of them have arrived, haven't become citizens. Some have lived in the UK don't wish to become British, British citizens, fine. But just because someone's been there for a long time and it does, has a British accent, that doesn't automatically mean that that person is British. And obviously, people of Indian stock who are British, British citizens, I totally accept them. They have the absolute right to be in the UK. There are some um, white supremacists or ethnic determinists who say, oh, well, passport's only a piece of paper. That doesn't count. You can never be British. It's all about ethnicity. No, that's a repulsive attitude. So, you know, you can be British, you can be Indian, you can be Indian and British, or British and Indian, however you wish to see it. These identities and being these citizenships, they can overlap. And uh, some people who are of Indian origin in the UK want to say they're British, they're not Indian. Fine, they see it that way. Um, I know a guy like this, a friend of mine, and okay, his family left India in the 1930s, uh, went to Kenya and then the UK, but you're not an Indian a bit, even a tiny bit, even an ancestry? Come on, that's just plain silly to not say you've got, to behave as though you've got no Indian ancestry at all. He doesn't deny that he has Indian stock, but he doesn't regard himself as India, Indian one bit. Um, anyway, so that's that. Uh, the Indian community in the UK is most, most fantastic. Contribution in every sort of way, in all, in all professions and... Something like 10% um, of British Indian men are doctors, and British Indian women is a bit lower, and often in the learned professions, wealthier than the average Briton, um, particularly the Punjabis. If you divide the UK population up by religious denomination, right, not just Christians, but break it down like Christian Anglicans, Christian Catholics, Christian Presbyterians, and then Jews, but also um, Hindus, and then Muslim Shia, Muslim Sunni Sikhs, the top the richest group of all by religion are Jews. The second richest are Sikhs. So not, not, exa not, not a, really an example of severe discrimination against uh, Sikhs. And of course, they're often a very visible minority, not just because of skin tone, but men often growing beards and wearing turbans and so on. So there are not many, many British Indians who join the British Armed Forces. And there are plenty of British Indians in politics, often uh, in the Conservative Party these days. So they're increasingly confident, been in the UK quite a long time. Some children are the fourth generation born in the UK. Fascinating, my British Indian pupils, they often didn't realise their community was quite a, a, a new one. So think about it. How about your parents say, oh, well, mum was born in India, she came here as a child. Well, dad was born here, but his parents had moved over. So that's actually not very long ago. But if you're 11, you know, 40 years ago is forever. But saying, really, in the grand scheme of, of history, 40 years is not a very long time. Um, so don't realise that, that they're actually quite a new thing, but now very much part of the furniture. So increasingly sure of their position within the UK. So um, British culture has obviously been influenced by India, and so many words from Hindi and other Indian languages have been uh, borrowed by the English language, and you'll find an Indian restaurant on every high street in the British Isles. What, what else can I say? I could talk about it for a very long time. Um, so, and then Bollywood films sort of going mainstream in the UK, and quite often Bollywood films have scenes filmed in the UK. So that's that. So the British Indian community is only about 4% of the UK population. If you add the other South Asian groups, uh, it would be more like 7% of the UK population. So uh, 
India certainly influenced the UK, I think mostly for the better. That's that. And it's only going to grow as the British Indian community is younger than average and more people are moving over, particularly after Brexit. There'll be fewer people coming in from the European Union. And so obviously Indian students come to the United Kingdom. They don't always stay, sometimes get their education and then leave. Freddie Mercury contributing to music or the famous journalists and cricketers. So in all walks of life, but I won't um, name uh, them all. Right, that's enough for the moment.